Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Emmeline Cheney. I'll be your moderator today. Um, I'm the Regional Advisor on Forest and Climate Change at UN Environment. We have an exciting lineup of experts from C4, FAO, UNDP, UN Environment, and Indonesia's Ministry of Environment and Forestry here with us today. Um, each of these experts will give a short presentation and then we'll open the floor for questions from you all. Um, for your information, the webinar will also be recorded so you can review and share it afterwards. Um, and we also encourage you to live tweet or share your thoughts on uh, social media using the hashtag Pitlands Matter and Forests Matter or tagging C4 or UN Red. Um, today's topic is on peatlands in Indonesia and their link to Red Plus and climate change mitigation. Uh, we will examine why the conservation and restoration of peatlands is so crucial from a scientific, environmental, economic and livelihoods point of view. And we'll also discuss potential solutions for protecting peatlands and preventing their loss in the future. Um, this topic is timelier than ever. Um, I'm sure you will have seen in the news that due to the extreme dry season and despite substantial efforts from the government of Indonesia, the forest and pit fires are back. Um, as of this August, the government has declared a state of emergency in the provinces of Riau, South Sumatra, West Kalimantan, Jambi, South Kalimantan and Central Kalimantan. Um, where extensive peatlands are particularly prone to fires. And our first speaker today will address the science behind why peatlands are so flammable. But let me start off by giving you a quick idea of the link between Red Plus, Indonesia and peatlands. So what is Red Plus? Uh, it's an acronym. Um, and it stands for Reducing Emissions from Deforestation and Forest Degradation. It is a framework under the International Paris Agreement climate change, on climate change, um, under which developing countries can receive payments for protecting their forests as a way of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Most tropical peatlands are forested and they store significant amounts of carbon about 20 times as much as other types of soil. Um, so the destruction or degradation of forest cover on peatlands delivers a double blow of, of carbon emissions, one from losses, uh, with losses from both the standing biomass, the trees, but also losses from the drying and degradation of peat soils. Um, Indonesia is a key country for Red Plus it has the third largest uh, area of tropical forest globally um, and is also home to about half of the world's um, tropical peatlands. This past February, Norway um, announced that it would provide the first reserve-based payments to Indonesia as part of a Red Plus agreement that was signed between the two nations in 2010. Um, this international recognition of Indonesia's efforts in reducing deforestation was really well merited. Primary forest loss dropped by 60% in 2017 compared to 2016. And the government is planning to continue with this trend uh, and has committed to reducing its emissions by 29% by 2030. This goal, however, will, will be difficult to attain if forest and pit fires continue to spike every few years, uh, hence our discussion today. Um, to give you um, a better picture, um, emissions from the, from the 2015 fire season in Indonesia have on some days um, exceeded the average daily emission of the United States. So with that quick background in mind, I will um, turn over to Johan Kieft, Lead Technical Advisor for the UNRED program in Indonesia. And his presentation is on fire, the challenge to sustainable management of tropical peatlands. Over to you, Johan. 
Okay, Emeline, uh, thank you, uh, thank you very much uh, for your introduction. And uh, my presentation will be about fire. And I have to underline that fire is a key is a key challenge to sustainable management of peatlands, both in the tropics as well as in temperate regions of the world. Uh, like fires have been common as well in um, in the in the past in uh, in uh, northwestern Europe, actually up to the time that even the, the city of Vienna in 18 uh, in 1928 was blanketed with haze, the same as now Singapore's experiences. So as as such. This is not a new problem, but it is a problem where I think we have to deal with because uh, uh, as we all uh, as we all know and as the uh, yeah as you are aware of fires is creating into substantial uh, damage to the economies and as well to the livelihood to the health of people in Southeast Asia and like as you can see, the, the, the impact of fires is, is both in terms of environment, economy and health of significance. We talked in 2015 about 2.6 million hectares burned, about an impact on the economy of $16.1 billion, particularly to haze uh, disturb transport, trade and tourism. And, and, and also in terms of uh, uh, fiscal expenditures towards, uh, towards fire suppression, and mobilization of, uh, of military and police troops to put fires out. The health impacts are significant, and most, most of these impacts for the people who are suffering from them are irreversible, so that will, people will, ha will feel the impact uh, throughout their lives. And this, as such, uh, in uh, close collaboration with the government of Indonesia, we have uh, established a so-called desired uh, state, which we aim that actually we move towards uh, a minimum or as possible as the targets of the government is zero wildfires, uh, ideally by next year or at least by 2025. And that means that we have to restore peatlands, we have health development and drainage of peatlands, we prevent this focus on fires and management, and we need to look at community, and we need to engage communities in those efforts to community-based fire pre uh, prevention, and then move towards an, um, and so what's called an integrated fire manage, uh, management approach, which brings all these elements together. And then means that we have to create capacity to deal with fires across the landscape uh, and engage all land users as much as possible. Cool. And now we'll now explain why are fire, peat fires so bad? Okay. As Emily explained in her introduction, uh, is that you peat, you talk basically about you have fuel in the soil, which in normal fires you don't have. You have mineral soils, mineral soils don't burn. But the peat fire is peat, peat, peat consists of carbon, of actually of, of forested materials uh, preserved on the water, which if drained are, are then getting exposed to fire. And that means as soon as you get a fire in the surface, on the surface, in the surface, uh, in the in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the in the surface vegetation, then it, it will re uh, lead to actually the fall over of, of, of trees. This means that the trees start falling over and then start burning. And that will create, and you, as we have talked about here, about 150 tons of biomass per hectare, that will then create actually a layer of fuel covering the peat soil. Okay, next slide. So, and as these uh, vertical trees now are laying on the peat, on, on the peat soil, then the subsurface peat soil it, it starts to burn and then gradually the, the fire starts moving into the peat. So the fire starts moving into the peat, so submerges into the soil. Okay. And then it starts burning into the, uh, into the soil and that creates substantial, uh, substantial greenhouse gas emissions and as well it creates that effectively the, the peat disappears, the peat disappears so the, the land surface comes down. So, and by coming the land surface is down and the fire intensifies, ultimately the uh, peat fires ultimately create substantial, uh, substantial uh, carbon dioxide emissions and this fuel and accelerating uh, uh, global warming. And you know, as was uh, as explained in the introduction, up to a level of uh, the same level as the overall emissions of the uh, United States as a whole on a daily basis. Okay. And then moving into the water and then burning in. And then given that subsurface uh, peat contains large amounts of biofuel, up to 1,000 uh, 
or over 1000 ton per hectare or more. And then so it's currently starting burning into, and that creates that, that the land, where the land subsides, the, uh, the, uh, the, the holes created by the fires, after the, uh, yeah, next, uh, next slide. After they created the uh, after they created the gaps, then after the rainy season starts, these gaps uh, are filled with water, and because of the water uh, reaches the underlying acid sulfate layer of the peat, which then turns the land and water acid. So the fire goes out, the fire is, uh, the, the fire disappears. But after the fire disappears, often the real problem starts because you, you will end up with an uh, with a landscape with in very high uh, acidity levels, which makes, for example, plant regrowth and others more difficult and creates effectively the former tropical forest effectively into uh, effectively wastelands. And that is why we are now working together with the government towards an integrated fire management approach, which uh, includes actually three uh, elements, increase the readiness, so have the systems and the warnings in place and, and the capacity in villages so that communities can, uh, if informed uh, by cell phones and so, can act, can act upon, can act upon fire warnings and, 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 and put cat fires out before they, before they spread into the, the, the peat. And then, uh, and that is a, the readiness and that, that requires response capacity, the response capacity includes the systems so that we have, uh, to what's called uh, incident command system, which means that uh, within villages there are people trained as incident commanders. We can have the ability to call in airplanes and to call in, in all kinds of support to make sure the fire doesn't spread. And after then the fire is put out, then we work towards recovery of the landscapes through a process like rewetting and uh, peat rewetting, peat restoration, restoration of vegetation, and so, so uh, and to do and that at the same time ensuring that the uh, risk levels within within the peat landscapes. Are being reduced, and by doing so, ultimately avoiding a uh, uh, a future, uh, you know, like avoiding future fire events, like as in 2019, uh, 2015, and uh, as we actually we hope now this year we already see that we already have been able to have some impact and been able to reduce fire risk, and we hope to actually accelerate that trend in the future. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Johan. Um, we will hold questions uh, until the end when we open up the floor. Um, so I now would like to turn uh, to Daniel Modiasso, who is principal scientist at C4, um, who will be explaining why peatlands are such unique and fragile ecosystems. Um, his topic is titled, Where have all the tropical peat forests gone? Daniel, over to you. Thank you, Melin. Um, well, the, the big question is, again, why, where they've gone and why uh, peatlands or tropical peatland matter to, to, um, in the battle of uh, climate change. So, um, peat swamp forest is very unique ecosystem in the tropic because they uh, serve a lot of ecosystem services that you can expect, including mainly storing huge amount of carbon uh, in, in this ecosystem. And they are kept and preserved there because the ecosystem is kept wet. So when you have peatland uh, and it's getting dry, that's, that's the beginning of the problem. So it's very important to, to have peatland always wet in order to keep the organic material which are potential to be emitted when it is dry uh, to be there. So um, when the conversion is taking place, deforestation is taking place, degradation of tropical peat swamp forests is taking place, they usually followed by uh, developing or establishing drainage canal in order to have the converted peatland uh, to be uh, uh, manageable. So draining is one thing in, in, in uh, the tropical peatland landscape. And usually in order to make the land more arable, um, to remove the biomass, uh, people put fire and that can happen very fast. 
So those um, carbon stored in many uh, years will be released in, in relatively quick uh, uh, period. And uh, if your pit is wet, then you will end up with smoldering fire. You have smokes, a lot of smoke and haze that will cause a lot of problem in terms of health and, and also feasibility in, in the air traffic, etc. But if the pit is dry, when, when the, the canal is established, very likely one will end up with blazing fire like uh, the picture in the bottom. So in order to look at uh, how uh, tropical peatland can be very uh, crucial and significant in, in combating climate change, uh, we, we try to look at the uh, amount of carbon release. Uh, uh, back in 2015, uh, we went out during that uh, big fire. Uh, during the month of September and October, we did measure what's happened and what is there in, in the haze. Uh, what we call fire emission factor was started to be quantified and we, we were impressed and amazed uh, to see that every single kilogram of dry peatland, it will release about one and a half kilogram of carbon dioxide. So imagine if you, you hold uh, such a small amount as, you know, kilograms of carbon dioxide. So if you imagine the, the size of pit burn and the depth of pit burn, that can be a lot. And in this particular uh, period in, in central Kalimantan, we. Uh, measure during those two months of October, uh, September, October 2015, every day around 11 million ton of carbon dioxide was emitted. So that's a large amount. Just to give you a um, comparison or perspective, that amount is larger than daily emission of the entire EU countries, uh, 28 countries, uh, daily emission is about 8.9, almost 10. But that fire in central Kalimantan was 11.3 million tons a day. So that's, that's the scale of disaster when, when fire is taking place. So why, why then um, it matters in terms of uh, combating against climate change? Again, we did measure the, this, the amount of carbon stored there. This is an example of uh, deep peatland with a depth of around five to six. In many places, we also can find 16 meters depth of, of pit. Uh, the amount of carbon stored in every hectare is about 1,500 ton. So that's about five times higher than uh, pristine tropical forests in every hectare. So that's, that's the potential of, of peatland if, if it is conserved uh, to be able to, to mitigate climate change. Uh, a lot bigger, the potential is a lot bigger than tropical forests itself. Because as you can see in, in the graph, the dark area is the amount of carbon underneath in the soil, in the peat, which is about 80% compared to the amount of the carbon in the forest. So even if tropical peat storm forest is removed, you still have a large amount, large portion of carbon underneath. So again, if it is kept there and wet, tropical peatland can be a potential uh, solution for climate change. If you look at this landscape, um, it's a contrast between degraded peat storm forest in the foreground is very light green and at the background is the secondary, not necessarily pristine. It's, it's been disturbed, but quite dark in the back. So one should think about combining mitigation and adaptation in this kind of situation because it can get burned very easily. Uh, you can see in the foreground is the canal, and that's draining canal suddenly if, if it is blocked you can put the water table back so that the, the soil can be moist enough to help the vegetation to grow when it is introduced and also at the same time reduce the emission because oxidation is avoided. So blocking the canal is one thing, 
and then reintroducing uh, tropical peatland species is another one. So uh, restoring peatland can uh, consider that in terms of uh, adapting with the changing climate and at the same time also uh, avoiding fire and, and, and also reducing emission. So uh, all these tropical forests um, already disturbed and, and affected by human intervention. A lot has been converted and, and we uh, are sure that uh, this uh, ecosystem, newly established ecosystem, will keep emitting, uh, be it uh, acacia, plantation, oil palm, or croplands, they're still emitting. So we try to look at this in order to quantify, again, the emission factor. And this is very important for monitoring when you are talking about introducing, for example, a red project. So one need to have the so-called emission factor for this particular land uses. In the left-hand side, you can see the emission factors for various land uses, including the highest one here is acacia plantation, followed by croplands and oil palm. So somewhere around 70 uh, ton per hectare uh, emission uh, that's happening in, in cropland, um, acacia plantation. On the right hand side, this is different presentation. It's a lifetime or life cycle of crops and, and trees. Uh, we use this 25 years. The amount of emission is quantified there as ecosystem. Again, we, we need to monitor this in order to report what's going to happen if you implement project in converted pitland or compare with pristine and conserved pitland. So my colleague will, will tell more about how to monitor this, especially land use chains and emission factor with regard to uh, disturbance in tropical forests. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, so indeed, I now turn to Adam Durand, who is acting FAO representative in Indonesia. Uh, his topic is titled Monitoring Peatlands for Climate Impacts and Benefits Using Ground and Satellite Data. So if you've ever wondered how you actually measure emission store in, in peatland, you'll want to tune in for that one. Adam. Thank you, Emmeline and Pat Daniel, for that introduction. Hello, colleagues here at C4 and online participants. My name's Adam Duran from the UN Food and Agriculture Organization. Uh, and as Daniel has mentioned, peatlands are very important for many things, many reasons, and in order to manage them better, we need to monitor them better. So I'm going to be talking about that with a particular emphasis on climate impacts. Next slide. So historically, peatlands have mostly been avoided by people. They've either been ignored or at worst, abused or degraded. And it's only recently that they've been getting attention due to fires and climate impacts that's changed those attitudes and practices. Uh, it's really pleasing that the Indonesian government has now got a policy of peat restoration, what they're calling three R's. This is rewetting, revegetation and revitalization that Daniel mentioned. Uh, those things are really important, but we still have some challenges in peatlands. They're difficult to access. The conditions inside the peatlands are wet and muddy. Uh, this means it's difficult to get people in there. Uh, it's hard to do monitoring inside peatlands. And it also means that we've got poor management inside the peatlands. There's weak enforcement. These are difficult areas to operate in. So we understand a little bit about why we want to monitor peatlands for these re-wetting and raising of the, the water tables. We want to revegetate those areas uh, and we want to create alternative livelihoods for the people that are living there. So we need to think about what we need to measure and to monitor them. One of the most important things from a carbon point of view is the biomass. That is not only the biomass in the trees above the ground, but as we've heard from Daniel, there's a lot of carbon in the peatland soil. And we've, we've also heard from Johan that that can actually burn when the peatland gets dry enough. So we need to monitor the groundwater level. That's the depth or the distance below the surface of the peat where the water goes down when the canals are put in and the peatlands are drained. When that happens, progressively there is this oxidation or the loss of peatlands, particularly made worse when the peatlands are burnt 
and you can get subsidence from the peatlands that is effectively greenhouse gas going into the atmosphere. So we need to be measuring all of those things, the groundwater level, the subsidence, the greenhouse gases, and ultimately, if it gets significant subsidence or loss of peatland, if it's near the coast, you can have inundation with, with water. Um, and that can actually lead to potential large loss of land. So this is a very important thing to be monitoring. We also want to be monitoring livelihood and economic information. I'm not going to talk about that today. I'm going to focus on the biophysical things for climate change. One of the most obvious we can do is uh, vegetation cover, changing, changing land use, deforestation, can be measured and monitored through satellites. Many people have seen pictures of that. Uh, we can also do fire hotspots. Fires uh, uh, show up very well in satellites and, we can, and there is an active program of measuring those things in Indonesia. In addition, we're actually getting much better at being able to do some other things with satellite data. Soil moisture data can actually be estimated by special satellites with radar data so that we can now get better estimates across the peatlands without actually having to go there. Um, next slide. So there are two basic ways, and I want to talk a bit about the advantages and disadvantages of how to measure peatlands. The first of which, of course, is field data collection, and the second one is remote sensing. Historically, field data has been the primary way of collecting peatland data. That used to mean going out to the field and measuring it manually. You can see people walking around here in peat swamps in this small picture. It's not easy work. Increasingly, we're putting automatic sensors in to peatlands to measure things like groundwater level, to measure greenhouse gases and subsidence. Those things are being done increasingly with automated machines, but most often it still has to have people going there in the field to do difficult uh, peatland work, research work. This is hard, wet, dirty work. It's slow and expensive, and in the end you only cover a very small area, so it's got its limitations. That's where the remote sensing comes in, because with satellites, aircrafts, drones, you can cover large areas very fast. We're getting much better satellites with, with increased resolution, even LIDAR, lasers are being used to measure peatlands. We can get very detailed maps now, and particularly they can give us consistent time series of maps that can show changes, really monitoring the peat in near, near real time. And increasingly this data is very cost effective because agencies are making it free. Of course, the cost of the satellite is expensive, uh, but those satellites are being built for many purposes to monitor the world and the data is increasingly available free. Free data is not the only thing. You still need to access that data, which is complicated. You need to process it with big computers and that requires skilled staff. But let me show you when you get all that data together, some of the information you can put also on, on the web to make that more available to the public and to managers. This is an example of Indonesia's peatlands monitoring system called PRIMS, Peat Restoration Information Monitoring System. And it's showing an, an area of Cal southern Kalimantan that has got huge areas of peatland in green. If we go through this, I'll also show you on the next slide, you can see the extensive areas of canals that have been put in across those peatlands. All of those canals are causing peat degradation, greenhouse gases, drying of the peat, and making them more susceptible to fires. With systems like this, people are now much more aware of how extensive those canals are and what a huge area of degraded peatlands we're dealing with. This helps the managers make better decisions and understand where to do the actions that they need to do to restore the peatlands. If we zoom in and have a look at one of those sites, I'm just showing you there, we'll zoom right in and have a look at the, what has been done in some of those peatlands. This map shows a backfilling, that is filling in of peatlands in the blue dots in a canal system there on the right hand side of that vertical line. Those areas have been filled to fill up the peatlands, to stop them draining, fill up the canal, stop the peatlands draining. In the background, the layer of pink and blue is showing some of the 
satellite data that is giving an indication of the changes in soil moisture between 2016 and 2018. You can see in the right hand side of that chart, the areas where they've done the backfilling, the areas are bluer. On the left hand side, it is pink and red. So we're still getting negative uh, drier peatlands. So we're seeing this as being a way to monitor peatlands, the, the restoration of peatlands using satellites. So the blue areas have positive change in soil moisture index, which is very promising. Last slide, please. So in conclusion, peatlands have huge potential. They have impacts on climate change, but they also have promise for restoring and absorbing more carbon. There are two basic methods for peatland measurement, field measurements and remote sensing. I've indicated or hinted at some of the rapid improvements in peatland monitoring and how we're able to get better monitoring data from automated groundwater levels, new satellites, high resolution, and even products like soil moisture. All of this is leading us to faster, cheaper, large area peatland monitoring. This is very positive. But I still want to reinforce that we've got many challenges remaining to be resolved. Peatlands are still mostly undervalued, under-resourced and poorly managed. We need to build the research and the capacity development to manage those peatlands better. But I want to end on a positive note. I think there's increasing recognition of climate change links, the urgency, political will. There's increasingly here in Indonesia particularly research being done on peatlands. Uh, the International Tropical Peatland Centre is being set up here in C4 in collaboration with the government with strong ministerial support. We're getting globally collaboration through the Global Peatlands Initiative between different countries. So hopefully we will learn the lessons of how to manage our peatlands. I think for, future, the peat, the, for peatlands, the future is promising. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Thank you very much. Um, all right, so let me now turn to Abdul Wahid Sitomorang, who is Senior Advisor for Natural Resources Governance at UNDP Indonesia. He's going to tell us about innovative financing for peatlands restoration and protection. Uh, thank you, Emeline and colleagues and online uh, participants. As uh, said by the previous uh, speakers, uh, it is very it is very imperative, important, you know, to manage uh, the pit land, and also you know to undertake uh, pit restorations. Well, you know, in order to to realize that, you know, uh, it requires you know sufficient budget. Budget is very important, you know, to you know to to undertake you know those you know uh, those you know those, those objectives. As you know, as you may know, uh, the government already uh, set up a target to restore uh, the degraded peatland. You know, up to 2020 is about 2.4 million hectares. So this is this is the this is the this is the priority. And if it is uh, restored, you know, it will also uh, create a you know, significant impact. You know, to to other you know uh, peatland areas. So this is the most priority. So, so I just want to uh, give you, you know, a sense, you know, in order to restore your know, 2.4 million hectares, uh, there is a budget exercise uh, done by uh, the Pillar Restoration Agency. Uh, it 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 requires, you know, about 10 trillion rupees. Is 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 or is it is similar uh, or it is equivalent to 700 and 79 uh, million uh, dollar so so it is quite you know it is quite you know uh, expensive and state budget alone uh, will not be sufficient you know to cover this uh, this you know this uh, this budget therefore uh, we need to explore other you know uh, financing mechanisms you know to 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 meet uh, to meet the to meet the targets there are several uh, innovative uh, financing mechanisms uh, that we can explore in addition to uh, state budget. So I just want to uh, I just want to highlight you know a few of them, and then you know we can explore uh, further through uh, question and answer. So the first one is uh, there is a potential you know to mobilize uh, uh, resources from uh, Islamic 
financing community. Uh, the the framework is already uh, set up uh, under the Ministry of Finance. Uh, they call it Green Sukuk. Uh, uh, under the Green Sukuk, uh, it is it is very possible, you know, to to use, you know, the uh, the 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 money, you know, to 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 do the to do the uh, uh, pit restorations and and pit uh, pit conservation. So this is, you know, this is uh, one one source that you know that, that the government can uh, can explore. And the second you know, option is through ecological fiscal transfer. Uh, if you if you are familiar you know, with you know with uh, with Indonesia fiscal transfer uh, instruments, at least there are there are two you know that you know that 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 we are very familiar. The first one is the uh, uh, general budget allocation. The second one is you know specific you know uh, budget allocation. For specific budget allocation, it is. It is it is kind of uh, this incentive mechanism. Uh, the poorer you are, you know, the the, the more you know you will get uh, transfer, you know, from from the central government. But there is also another in you know, a fiscal transfer, and this is very very I mean it is very innovative that the government of Indonesia has. They call it you know investment fund. So in in this you know if you know if uh, the province uh, government has a good initiative, you know, to protect their peatland or protect their, you know, or do, you know, the innovative things, you know, to restore the peatland, then they can have, you know, the investment fund. It is, it is, it is positive incentive, you know, uh, kind mechanism. The issue is, you know, uh, it is not yet included uh, in the criteria to, to get the investment fund now. So, so it is, it is very important, you know, to encourage, uh, the, the the central government to also include you know uh, peatland restorations and peatland conservations you know also one of the indicator you know for province or province you know to to get you know, the, the investment fund of course you know private responsibility is very important and and the minister of environment policy can can tell more you know how you know private responsibility is is also a game changer you know to to do this crowdfunding blended financing and payment for environmental services and polluter pay mechanisms, uh, it is in you know, a law enforcement uh, thing, can also you know uh, contribute significantly to mobilize resources you know, to, to 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 restore the degraded peatland. So in the uh, in the conclusions, you know, I just, I just I just want to highlight that you know that that you know uh, resources is very important, and state budget alone cannot cannot cover all you know to to do it, to do it, and and therefore you know we need to explore uh, other mechanisms you know to 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 meet you know the the targets. That's all, Emily. Thank you, Chuck. Um, uh, and finally, our last speaker of the day um, is Mr. Jati Wichaksono Adi. Chief of Public Relations Bureau uh, at the Ministry of Environment and Forestry, Indonesia. Um, Mr. Jati will, will offer some final closing remarks, including a video on the remarkable biodiversity of Indonesia. Please, Mr. Mr. Jati. Hello, good afternoon. Prof. Daniel, Mr. Johan, Mr. Uchok, and Emeline and Adam, hi. Yeah. Um, on behalf of Ministry of Forestry and Environment and Forestry, hello. Yeah. Uh, Indonesian uh, has commit a commitment. Indonesia, I can say to the the Indonesian as ratified Paris Agreement under the law number 16 at 2016 to ensure our commitment to uh, for sustainable forest and pit management and to reduce carbon emission under IDD plus scheme. And Indonesia uh, has put in uh, place a uh, plus infrastructure consists of 
RDD National Strategy Frame, ya, yeah, uh, NFMS, and Safeguard Information System uh, plus um, Monitoring, Reporting, and Verification System. And today uh, we are uh, on the finalized step to the making result the base payment uh, reality. Uh, and then Indonesia has established and well run the national strategy system on climate change called NRSCC to uh, together information on all RADG plus related activity activities on climate change mitigation and adaptation the data is represent to ensure transparency and easy to the understand by multi stakeholders okay. and uh, in progress the annual emission reduction from forest and pit during the period of 2000 to 2060 is uh, 70900 yeah giga giga uh, co2 equivalent if the emission from the pit fire is taken out the average rate would be 466035 giga Gigaton, yeah. gigaton CO2 equivalent, which contribute from pit the uh, decomposition of annual rate of 305, 304, 377 gigaton uh, CO2 equivalent. The significant improvement made a fire mitigation and response compare to uh, 2060 emission reduction from pit fire has significant drop from two oh, uh, seven uh, twelve thousand gigaton to uh, 2015 to uh, 90 thousand gigatons CO2 equivalent and in 2017 a pit fire emission is on average 12,000 gigatons CO2 equivalent. The government has issued ministerial decree to protect and manage pit ecosystem in 2014 with further revised in 2016. We be uh, emphasize on the pit function of carbon as carbon storage and to conserve biodiversity. And uh, <coughs> new uh, paradigm uh, social forestry as flagship program in ensure to the community uh, active participation on sustainable forest management the 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 social forestry is uh, to make uh, sure to the uh, forest management unit or kph uh, in the our as our future fmu Oh, forest management unit now as KPH Satuan Pengolahan Hutan, which have three type for KPIP, yeah, forest production for uh, KPHL for forest uh, protection forest and KPHK for conservation forest and uh, public private partnership 
so the variation mean one of them is engaging private sector as restoration ecosystem partners and uh, media as core partner in ensuring public engagement heard and taken into consideration on all ministry on uh, uh, of environment and forestry program yeah i think enough thank you Emily. thank you thank you yeah. I understand you have a, a video, the, the ministry has yeah. a video that you would like to be shown, so um, I'll ask um, our colleagues to show the video now. Indonesia is one of the largest archipelagic countries in the world, with more than 17,000 islands that spread over an area of more than 2 million kilometer squares. Indonesia is host to several unique ecosystems, containing a large number of diverse species. At least 10% of the world's flowering species which counts to over 25,000 species, flourish in Indonesia. There are also 12% of the world's mammals, 16% of reptiles, 17% of birds, 6% of amphibians, and over 45% of fishes, all of which are parts of the nation slash biodiversity. In order to preserve its biodiversity, which also contributes hugely to the world, Indonesia has taken significant steps in accordance to the national and global target on biodiversity framework. The government has allocated more than 500 units of protected area spread throughout the country, with the total coverage area of 22 million hectares terrestrial and 20 million marine protected area. Because of its uniqueness and universal values, six protected areas are recognized as World Heritage Sites, 16 Biosphere Reserves, 7 Ramsar Sites, and 7 ASEAN Heritage Sites. Many studies and researches has also been conducted to identify plants and animals to assess their potential uses for medicine, food, energy, and biocontrol for a chemical hazard. Some community-driven activities such as ecotourism has also contributed to the effort to preserve Indonesia's biodiversity, which also encouraged cooperation among local stakeholders. The results are heartening. By 2019, Indonesia has been able to increase the population of endemic and priority species. Communities have also enjoyed benefits from this improved environment through ecotourism, environmental services, and other significant conditions, which contribute to their quality of life as a whole. There is little doubt that Indonesia's vast biodiversity plays a hugely significant role in reducing the impacts of climate change. By preserving its biodiversity and its ecosystems, Indonesia can help support the entire planet's sustainability and ensure a better future for all humankind. Thank you very much. Um... Okay, with this, I'd like to thank you all uh, for your presentations and also um, thank everyone for their kind attention. We, we will now uh, open the floor uh, to questions, starting with those in the, in the audience and the C4 offices. Um, for those uh, joining us online, I'll be asking you in a few minutes um, to type your questions in the chat box and I'll pick up the questions from there. And if you could please indicate who you're addressing the question to, that would be useful. Um, on that note, I also wanted to um, indicate that we have another expert in the audience, uh, Yves Lomonier, who is C4 senior scientist specialized in ecology and mapping. So if you have uh, questions in particular on the mapping um, related to the fire, peatlands, or red flats in general, uh, you can also send your question to him. So, um, okay, uh, over to those in, in, in C4 to pick up a couple of questions. Maybe we'll take two questions from the audience, please. Well, I have a question for you. Um, when you list down the potential uh, financial scheme, what are the most 
accessible and uh, already been implemented so far with regard to climate change from the list you had, including Sukuk and other things. Well, thank you, uh, Daniel, for your questions, you know, and I will also, you know, uh, answer there is also questions from Jan Peters. Uh, the question is, you know, are there any thoughts about using carbon credit schemes or financing uh, keep everything, right? So, Prof. <coughs> uh, Daniel, you know, uh, uh, <coughs> the, 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 yeah, among the among the among the uh, among the financing mechanisms, you know, uh, uh, private responsibility is you know has been you know has been uh, has been used has been has been implemented, you know, because because it, it there is a you know there is a there is a request you know from the from the government from the Minister of Environment Forestry for you know for private sector you know to also undertake you know uh, the uh, the peer research you know in their concession area. So private responsibility. Concrete question is, uh, which one is accessible and who is using that? Well, the, the, well, you know, if I, if I, if I may answer, you know, Islamic financing, you know, is, is, you know, is, uh, is the most accessible. Uh, Islamic financing is the most accessible because, because, you know, the framework is already there. Uh, and the government, you know, is already, the government, you know, issuing, issuing, uh, Sukuk, you know, every year. Well, you know, it is it is up to uh, uh, ministry whether they want to use, you know, Sukuk or not, or not, you know, to finance, you know, the the peat restoration. So there is nobody using it so far. So for for peat restoration, you know, it's not yet. For peat restoration, it's not yet. But for conservation, for national park, they already access that. Who who is using it? Uh, Minister of Environment and Forestry, one of the ministry uh, already already you know, used you know, the, the sukuk, the green sukuk. I was thinking of private sector or something like that, no? Well, the suk, this is the sovereign sukuk, Pak. This is the sovereign sukuk. It's not, uh, this is not in you know, a private sukuk. Well, you know, uh, it is also possible, you know, for private sector to issue, you know, uh, uh, sukuk, you know, uh, to finance, you know, their, their you know, their, 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 you know, their activity to, to restore, you know, the, the pit areas. So it is possible. Okay, thank you very much. I think I see that questions are already piling up in the, in the question box. Thank you so much. I'm taking note of all of them. Just before we get to them, I'll now pick a question from the audience. Great, thanks so much for the, for the fantastic webinar. Um, I'm Amy Duchal, a scientist here at C4. And I just have a question actually for the two people sitting in the room here who are focusing a little bit more on the research and monitoring side. And I'm just wondering, you know, sort of given a bit of the crisis state of peatland um, conservation, the fires that are happening now, if you had an unlimited amount of funds where would you target those funds in terms of critical peatland research and critical monitoring research? If, if we follow the um, pattern that uh, BRG, for example, is using the triple R, I think the third R would be the most immediate and impactful uh, way to do. That's the uh, revitalization of the local um, livelihood including alternative of livelihood, that would be, you know, straightforward and measurable in terms of um, avoiding further deforestation and degradation on draining pitland. And also this will have a long-term impact if uh, one can really demonstrate the result of that intervention. Uh, from, thanks for the question, Amy. From my side, I think in terms of the topics, I would have, uh, I, I support Daniel's view on the social, uh, socioeconomic side. That's very much needed. Um, we do need to provide a, an alternative livelihood for the people living and working around the peatlands. Um, those are the people that are using fire for their own subsistence livelihoods in many cases, and we need to help them change their practices by giving them an alternative. But I think we, we need to be doing more than just one thing. We need to be doing multiple things. So at the same time as doing those programs, if we had unlimited funds, 
the activities like uh, rewetting, the active work that's being done on that is, uh, is really important and we should be doing that at the same time as helping people move away from, from those practices, the damaging practices. Blocking the canals and filling, filling them up and getting water back into those peatlands is one of the most important things we can do to stop the fires. In terms of places to where to do it, it's clear to me that Indonesia is, is the, the hotspot globally. It's also the, uh, the place where there is most political will, most interest and focus. So it's, it's clearly a good place to start. We also should be looking at other countries that are before they make the, these same kind of past practices and open up their peatlands before they realize how difficult it is. And we've been doing that through the Global Peatlands Initiative by bringing other countries here. So sharing the lessons learned and experiences and Indonesia and the Minister of Environment and Forest herself is very keen on that, sharing that information with other countries to avoid uh, bad practices occurring on other peatlands elsewhere. Thanks. Thank you. Um, on the note, we have a, a question from Lok Sapkota, uh, which I think uh, would be well answered by Johan and Mr. Jati. Um, the question is, in light of climate change, is there any temporal uh, change in terms, of, in terms of seasonal change uh, in peatland fire? Uh, are there any spatial patterns of peatland fire in relation to management? Uh, social forestry was mentioned as an approach and this um, person is interested to know uh, if that has made a difference in dealing with uh, pit uh, fire. So Johan, would you like to answer that question? Yeah, of course. I can thank you for your question. And yeah, I think we have to underline that in the while even in Southeast Asia, it is of course mainly an Indonesian problem, but recently, recently we saw substantial peatland fires in Southern Thailand. And this shows as well the sensitivity. And indeed, by clearing peat from forest, you create changes in the microclimate, which will lead to more, uh, to more, uh, to more, dr to, to drier conditions, to drier conditions, and thus uh, earlier dry out of the topsoil. And thus, given that the topsoil consists in peat consists mainly of of uh, organic uh, forest materials. Thus, uh, higher chances in f uh, more chance of fires. So, in in nature, if you look at natural circumstances, you don't see. Now, there are expectations, but you don't hardly see fires in uh, in, in in intact tropical in intact tropical in, in intact tropical primary peat forest. So, as soon as you remove the as soon as you remove the forest cover, you initiate the process of uh, of also besides global climate change also of of local microclimate changes, which, lead, which indeed lead to more, to, to more, to more chances in forests, and that will also follow your spatial distribution of fires. Thank you, Mr. Jati. Would you like to, since you mentioned social forestry in your presentation, would you like to um, add something? Sorry, you're on mute. Yeah. Um. On social forestry, the, until now, uh, Ministry Environment and Forestry uh, has issued a certificate for uh, three three million hectares for uh, surrounding people. Uh, from forest in uh, indigenous community uh, in on uh, surrounding the forest and uh, uh, the the team in uh, ministry of forestry has prepared to the social forestry uh, make a more uh, until uh, five Five million in uh, end of 2019. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, all community in the surrounding uh, forest will be respond responsible for the uh, forest fire. Uh, 
in inside the the, the community fire brigade or uh, self support to the forest fire uh, uh, combating yeah mm -hmm. yes and uh, Mangala Agni is uh, under control for the G uh, climate change. Uh, should be uh, stand by in the side by side for the control uh, with hotspot monitoring in uh, all of uh, Rawan Kebakaran. What? Uh, vulnerable. Vulnerable uh, yeah. area and on uh, seven province in Indonesia. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Mr. Jati. Thank you. Um, okay, another question we received from our colleagues uh, of the RECOP to the Center for Forests, for People and Forests, sorry. Uh, they are interested in learning about the integrated management of Pitwam landscapes. And uh, and you know, recognizing that there is competition, uh, competing demands for water, they like to learn more about how to develop and implement pin swamp landscape integrated management for both biodiversity and livelihood development. Uh, so, if any of the panelists have experiences um, of how to bring together water, forestry, irrigation, agriculture, fishery, water transportation. Um, to design uh, landscape management plans. So, um, who who could take this um, this question? Johan, go ahead. Okay, I'm in. Thanks. Okay, the, uh, the the governance of peatlands, particularly the water governance of peatlands, is essential. And in a sense, if you look at traditional practices, also here in Indonesia. Like for example, the handle and handle associations, the Central Kalimantan are an example of how already communities have dealt with you know, like sustainable management of peatlands. And I think in that perspective, it's now that the Indonesian government is moving towards KHGs or, or peat hydrological uh, uh, peat hydrological uh, systems. Yeah, yeah, that is actually and that that is an important step towards more you know like some more landscape-based management of peatlands. However, that will as well more active engagement in the by land users, like you see, for example, in these handles where actually land users uh, associate themselves and collaborate on land use and also on maintenance of water infrastructure. Like the same now has to happen at a larger scale at KAG levels, and that's why we're actually already currently working with the Indonesian Coordinating Ministry of Economic Affairs and with the Ministry of Environment and Forestry to look at models to apply in Indonesia. And as part of that, we have facilitated a recently a, a, a study trip to uh, the Netherlands for the Ministry of Environment and Forestry to look there at so-called water boards or water scuffs, which are based around on similar principles. And uh, we're now looking at, in a sense, applying that at a larger scale. And of course, I think like a center like Recoft or so, of course, because that will, re that will require substantial build up of, of, of uh, human capital in terms of capacity of dealing with this. Because yeah, we have to admit that the uh, like in the current situation where peatlands are used and there are community peatlands, parts of forest, parts of forest lands, parts are outside the forest estate and so on. But then we have to, yeah, we have to uh, use the uh, ecologically most relevant boundaries and which are defined by hydrology. So we need to build governance systems around these. And that's currently, that, that currently we are working on as UN environment in close collaboration with the Indonesian government and amongst other with partners, with, with partners like the FAO, UNDPC4, and like uh, Wagner University Research Center and uh, with Kamitra. Thank you. Thank you, Johan. So uh, we also have a, an interesting question on financing from, from Jan Peters, uh, and actually echoed by, I believe, Rikoft as well. Uh, they are wondering whether there are any thoughts about using carbon credit schemes for financing peatland rewetting. Um, Yuchok, you want to take that one? Uh, thank you, Emily, and thank you, you know, for the questions, you know, uh, well, whether it is, it is possible, you know, using carbon, uh, carbon credit schemes, you know, I will put in a carbon credit schemes, you know, under payment for environmental services, right, uh, as, a, as an umbrella of, 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 of these mechanisms, you know, 
yes it is you know yes it is possible uh, yes it is possible and if 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 we look at you know uh, gcf the green climate fund uh, it is it is very possible you know for country you know to assess uh, to access uh, these mechanisms you know uh, for carbon credit scheme, uh, schemes and and this is you know for the multilateral uh, mechanism for for you know voluntary and bilateral mechanisms you know uh, if we look at you know uh, indonesia case you know, with norway or any other countries you know uh, uh, finland you know is also included you know as as one of you know uh, as one of the uh, activity that are eligible you know to to get you know carbon credit schemes you know. so so yes you know it, it is very possible is there any question? Is there any I miss? Uh, no, no. I think uh, I mean if somebody wants to add something, otherwise we have other questions coming up. Um, so, um, like another question that we received is uh, for uh, Daniel and Adam. Um, it's about um, you mentioned, you know, ecological restoration by rewetting in natural succession. But um, uh, we are wondering whether there are also plans for to implement alternative plantations on uh, rewetted sites in polyculture. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, if I understand it correctly, it was about whether polluticulture has been uh, tested or trialed. For those who don't know what polluticulture is, it's the practice of growing or managing the land, in a, a peatland in a wet condition, so that you keep the, the soil moisture, the peatland moisture, near, close or near to the surface, like in natural conditions, but you're growing crops or uh, grasses or trees that actually are adapted to those conditions. So many native species uh, and that, but you're still using them for certain, certain purposes. So certainly polluticulture is a very attractive method for peatlands because you can actually use the peatlands, but you're keeping them in a wet condition so they don't degrade. Uh, however, it's not a practice that is well uh, understood yet. We've got a list of polluticulture species and there have been some small scale research trials, but it hasn't been done on very big areas yet. So certainly we need to scale that up. There is technology saying it's possible, but how to do it over large areas and how to make it economically viable is also a big challenge. So definitely research needs to be done on that. Uh, FAO and others, the Ministry of Environment and Forestry Research Group uh, here in uh, Fordia, it's called in Indonesia, has done uh, trials on that. They do have established demonstration plots. What we need to do is to get some funding and some finance to really scale that up, test it across large areas, and to get some of these products that are used from those polluted culture into an economic market chain so that people can make a, a, you know, a genuine livelihood uh, uh, business out of it and also sustainably manage it, test it so that it's sustainable. So those things are promising but they're not demonstrated at a large scale yet. And we need to actually put those in place, particularly on the areas of peatlands that have been moderately degraded, but can be restored with this active, active revegetation. Uh, but there are already people living there. So I encourage that. Thanks for the question. Daniel, would you like to add something? Yeah, well, this polluticulture practice can be um, combined with the, well, in the Indonesian context, the R3 one, which is the uh, revitalization of the local community. And I think uh, one should be mindful that uh, preference is, is always with the local people. So we have to be careful in introducing uh, polluticulture species. If it is not well received, um, we might end up with problems. So it would be nice to, after being tested uh, scientifically, uh, one need to explore, you know, the, the, the uh, um, response from the local community, how they perceive about these species. And certainly market is very important. 
Um, they usually have um, practiced a lot of, you know, local species like rubber in, 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 in the peatland, and they know the market, they know the network, and they have practiced that for a long time. And this, this is one thing that needs to be considered also. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, one more question from a colleague from Carnegie Climate uh, Governance Initiative. Uh, the question is, what kind of international governance or scheme uh, is needed to promote national, global, and regional efforts in restoring peatlands, um, in particular to balance different goals, including climate change, biodiversity, and livelihoods? What kind of capacity building is needed at different levels? So it's like a, a big picture question, but I think uh, quite a relevant one as well. Um, Anybody wants to take it on? Daniel, please go ahead. Daniel Certainly. first. Daniel. <laughs> Certainly, the, the Paris Agreement is one thing, and it's still quite hot in terms of the uh, uh, political uh, will. And in the light of the nationally uh, determined contribution, uh, Pitland certainly can be part of this exercise. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the carbon asset is certainly very significant. Um, the, uh, especially in Indonesia, we know effort has been made how to uh, include this in, in the uh, NDCs. Um, in the early uh, submission of the FRL, um, peatland has been included, but uh, pit fire is not there. So if we connect between this improvement of FRL and NDC and BUR and other these governance processes and, and reporting uh, mechanism, I think uh, Paris Agreement will be uh, a prominent destination to uh, get the uh, activities, uh, get the attention of the activities on, on the ground. So uh, that's, that's one thing, but if it is, uh, related to other uh, services that peatland can provide, uh, including biodiversity, one can also use other mechanism within the biodiversity convention as well. So multiple approaches uh, can be exercised in terms of global governance. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Johan, you wanted to add something? Yes, well, an option is, and that we are starting to work on that now is to look at, at the international uh, uh, trading mechanisms like for example the ECOA, the airline industry uh, Corsia scheme and to start including and to start working on make, uh, making uh, emission reductions from peatlands uh, and actually marketable and that there will require of course better monitoring system and effort systems. There are of course already uh, VCS, voluntary carbon scheme uh, projects active in Indonesia like Rimber Makmurutama, Rimber Makmurutjaya, who successfully have been trading uh, emission reductions to international buyers. Uh, and so there is certainly scope, and there's certainly scope for more, but I think as well as, uh, yeah, international organizations active in peatlands, I think like C4, FAO, Unifiement, UNDP, uh, and particularly, uh, yeah, I think we, um, yeah, we should work, uh, we are working uh, in a sense of putting the, the, the building box in place to indeed make that happen and uh, through, uh, through, research, through, through international research based uh, payment schemes. And, uh, and I think particularly Indonesia is of course is one case, but I think I would like to underscore as well. We hear that the, of course, there are large peatlands in South America, in the Amazon basin as well in, the, in, in Africa, and particularly in the Congo area, which of course have are facing similar challenges. If you look at the recent Brazil forest fires, I think it underlies that's certainly not only an Indonesian problem. And uh, that means as well that, that there is a need for global action to go beyond the Paris Agreement and look at ways that we uh, to, to, to better link in peatlands in the international in the international carbon offset markets. To bring in the additional resources to accelerate efforts by government. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I am... Hi, happy? Yes, Mr. Jesse, yes, please. Yes, I want to add information on sustainable pit management in Indonesia. Yeah. Uh, the first, 
under Director General uh, Pollution Control, uh, we we have been um, success successfully and monit pit monitoring and uh, mapping the pit areas and pit dome under concession holders area. This will uh, help us monitoring pit management and enforce private sector uh, also responsible. And second, the moratorium for new palm oil plantation. And uh, that one, uh, law enforcement. Until now, the Director General of Law Enforcement, 110 companies has been sent work, uh, warning, warning by Ministry on Environment and uh, Forestry, and 19 company are being suspend on on their concession. 14 company are being investigated, and uh, one on process on the court. Yeah, I hope the the uh, I hope the the law enforcement make uh, effective. Yeah, very effective for the uh, forest fire control in Indonesia. Thank you. Thank you for this complimentary information, Mr. Jetty. Um, we we close to to having to to wrap up, but um, I understand there is one more question from the audience at SIPA offices. Thank you for the chance to ask a question. My name is Ian. I'm a researcher in here. I actually want to ask in everyone's mind in here, which actor actually have the most potential to make the effort of peatland restoration become sustainable in the long term, like which actor actually have the most potential to make the effort of peatland restoration become sustainable in the long term? That's my question. Yeah. Thank you very much. This is, I think that's a, that's a great question. And, and, and what I'll do is that I'll give everyone, each of the speaker, a chance to answer and, and share any final thoughts before we close. So starting with you, Daniel. The question is about who is the most influential influence and actors. I don't know. Uh, maybe everybody can play a role in different ways. Uh, we cannot single out one particular actor in handling this huge problem, extensive in terms of area as well as you know unique situation in places. We cannot single out one uh, particular actor. Um, it depends on what is driving. Uh, the deforestation, degradation, and also draining and, and use of fire. So uh, if those are well identified, I think those are the you know, actors or stakeholders that you, one needs to, to work with very closely. Um, that's why I keep saying about R3, the revitalization. If, if that is the, the case, uh, then how can you, you know, find out the alternative for these actors to uh, have alternative for their, for their livelihood? Uh, if it is local community, and which local community, which, which area they, they, are, they have different kind of interests and objective. So, sorry, I cannot say one particular one and uh, it should be well studied. Thank you for the question. From my side, in uh, I, I would say that there, like Daniel says, there are many actors that have many roles, but I think they have different roles. Clearly, the government in many countries uh, has a huge role to play in terms of land management decisions. I mean, governments put in place policies and legal frameworks that allow what happens in, in land or give licenses, uh, or in the case of Indonesia, 
uh, put a moratorium and then take them away. And we've heard just then some very sort of strong action being taken by the Ministry of Environment and Forestry in Indonesia on enforcement by, to, to make sure that those policies and practices are, are pursued by companies. So that's really clear leadership and, and it's pleasing to hear. So the government has a clear role. But I also, I think we've got other actors and players, it's good you put it that way, um, we've got companies who have uh, leasehold lands or licenses to operate in certain areas. Different countries have different arrangements for that. They need to be given guidelines on how to manage peatlands. Many times their, their perspective is making profit. They don't necessarily know that what they're doing is, is unsustainable. A lot of this peatlands uh, management knowledge is only relatively recent and I'm talking the last few decades. Um, so we need to inform them they need to follow the rules, but we also need to inform them on how to, how to run their businesses to produce their products, hopefully change their products to something that could be more sustainable on those lands. Consumers who are buying those products need to be educated. They need to learn where their, their products are coming from and become more aware of the impact that might have. Certainly that's happened with a number of products and I think there's a long way to go on that. Finally, I'd say that there's a, there's a really strong role for local people, as Daniel has mentioned a couple of times. The original people who lived on a lot of these lands, the indigenous peoples, they knew how to manage these lands sustainably. And many of them are still uh, there in the margins of that. They're often in between their traditional livelihoods and the new market-based economy. Getting them an opportunity to be able to go back and live a more traditional life if they want to, or at least learn how to do some of those activities in a more sustainable way and make a livelihood out of it is a really important thing that we could be encouraged. So there's a lot of actors with different roles, putting them all together and informing them of these things is, is a huge challenge, but it's, a, it's something we need to do. Thanks. Thank you. Um, let's go over to uh, you, Chuck, and Johan. Okay, now I think to the actors, I think it's already been explained by the previous speakers, all actors have to play a role. But I particularly, as coming from the international community, I think uh, our role is important as well. And I think in the recently, um, the way we have uh, facilitated, for example, the cooperation, South-South cooperation between countries to the Brazzaville Agreement, I think it's an example how we can, as the international community, bring the, uh, the PTC to, uh, to the table. And then an underline as well that peat is a global issue. It's not only in the tropics, but it's also an issue of temperate countries. And it's not only it's not only in the tropical commodity supply chain, but also in products like from temperate regions. Like for example, most of the European da dairy products are produced on peatlands, which are emitting greenhouse gas emissions as we speak. So from this perspective, I think we have all to play have a role. And I think that our role as the international community is actually to articulate and make both member states but also the uh, the wider communities aware of the importance of this tropical peatland to uh, avoid a global climate disaster and uh, while at the same time uh, share and help to share and facilitate uh, solutions to address these issues well you know uh, for me you know uh, uh, there are two actors in addition in addition to you know to to actors has been had been explained by the previous speakers, you know. Uh, number one is you know the, the the international community in terms of you know uh, mobilizing resources, you know, uh, to support you know the peat restoration and peat conservation, you know, uh, implement uh, done by by you know by country uh, who that have uh, have peatland uh, peatland area. So. So it is also important you know, for uh, for international community to to support you know, in terms of the financing because because you know uh, because uh, the country itself uh, uh, is not is not sufficient you know, to, to 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 do that. Number number two is you know the journalists you know as a journalist you know uh, it's very important you know to to write you know uh, an article uh, to educate you know public how important you know pitland you know for not only for you know for environment for ecosystem but also for local people uh, by by writing a good a good article uh, will also contribute you know uh, for you know for people to protect and conserve uh, and and love the peatland thank you and finally mr jetty would you like to share a couple of words just very briefly before we wrap up yeah 
talking about the responsible for controlling the pit ecosystem yeah of course of a ministry of environment and forestry has a function as regulator facilitator and controlling the implementation uh, of course we cannot work it alone therefore we closely collaborated with other countries ministry uh, other ministries sorry brg international organization private sectors and active participant from communities we also strengthen cooperation with other countries such as Congo, Norway, Peru, Brazil, Germany, and many others. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and on that note, I'll thank you again for joining us today. Uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to us if you have any uh, follow-up thoughts or questions. I see that some colleagues would be interested in, in receiving the presentations. You can reach the organizers um, by contacting the, the contact details were indicated in the in the advert for this webinar. But they are, we can also reach us on social media at C4 and at UN Red. Um, and because we'd really like to hear from you, this is a discussion. But uh, for now, this is goodbye. So thank you all and have a nice day. <laughs>